Well, this is Bob Browner again. I've had a lot of questions around COVID, flu, and RSV, so I thought it worthwhile doing an update after uh, quite a long break. So a couple things. First, we have been have enough years of data now that I think we can debunk a lot of the, the memes and myths that were out there. So, for example, people for a while were saying, well, those people are going to die anyway. Well, the CDC tracks the number of people who, quote, die anyway for every week and has been doing this for going back decades, and this is what it looks like, basically. Uh, they have an excess mortality curve, and essentially what you're looking for, orange is the average expected number of people who are going to, quote, die anyway. Red is when it's above where you'd expect, and if it's significantly higher than something's going on, this is a bad flu year, the last bad influenza year where we had, you know, roughly 50,000 deaths. And then in relation, you can see all the waves of COVID were far worse. So it's pretty obvious, A, these people weren't going to die anyway. B, it was worse than, than a, a typical flu year. And the natural herd humanity people were wrong because we had wave after wave after wave. Uh, the reason this, this wave is smaller is mostly due to vaccination. It is a little bit, yes, that people did get some infections and had some immunity. But even in the third year, we had over 100,000 deaths. And so uh, some of these memes are part of our problem. And so I'll talk a little bit about today, plus uh, what we might want to do going forward. So uh, one question early on, there's a meme that, oh, COVID is a seasonal virus. So we don't have to worry about it during the summer. Uh, and I, th there's actually no evidence to back up that at least this COVID uh, uh, virus is seasonal. And I think the real question isn't whether the viruses are seasonal. I think actually it's, it's we that are seasonal. So for example, if we look at the hospitalizations over the last couple of years from COVID, you'll see that there's two distinct peaks. Uh, there's the late summer peak and the winter peak, late summer, winter, late summer. So what's happening during these times? Well, July and August, it's hot outside. People want to go inside the air conditioning, so they go inside, which is where COVID is best spread. Winter, same thing. It's cold outside. People go where the heat is, and so they go in where it's best spread. And so I think it's not that the virus is seasonal. I think we're seasonal because we go inside in the air conditioning late summer, and we go outside in the, in the heating in the winter, and it's the uh, the hunkering in indoors with lots of other people, which is the ideal phase for respiratory viruses to spread. And I think that's the real story. Uh, so COVID, influenza, and RSV, I think we need to think of these all as a, sort of a, a pack of things that go together with similar strategies to, to minimize their impact in terms of hospitalizations and death. So uh, one of the things I think it, that's always a great, fair answer to any physician is what would you do? So what did I do when it came to COVID and flu vaccinations? Well, uh, last weekend, I went and I got my flu shot and my COVID shot. And so if you want to check your own vaccinations, uh, if you lost your card and don't want to keep that or anything updated, you can go to the Nebraska State Immunization System or Nessus and type in your name, birth date, social security number. And for most Nebraskans, it will pull up your vaccination record. So here's mine. Uh, you can see my spike back, which is actually the name brand from, from Moderna, and my flu shot. Uh, both were uh, given. And, and uh, the, the, this actually came into the system pretty quickly. I got my vaccine at Hy-Vee on a Saturday. And by Monday morning, it was already in the Nessus system. Uh, there is a new one called Novavax. Well, maybe not that new. It, it was coming out before. Uh, Novavax had production issues, and so a lot of people were disappointed that it wasn't available. It is going to be available again. Uh, it works as far in terms of effectiveness. is very similar to the effectiveness of both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. However, it's a different formulation. And so two people might want to think about Novavax. And uh, this is a post from Caitlin Gentilino, which I think she does a great job describing it. So one, if for whatever reason you're hesitant about mRNA biotechnology, well, Novavax doesn't use that. So I guess it addresses those fears, even though I don't think those fears are actually founded. On the, the other thing is because of how it, what happens is rather than using mRNA to tell your body to make the spike protein, Novavax is the, just the injection of the actual spike protein. So it skips a step. And the benefit of that is there are fewer side effects. And so Caitlin Gentilina for herself, she had uh, uh, more severe reactions when she got the shots as far as achiness and tired and fatigue and things like that. So she's going to wait for the Novavax because of the side effect profile. Uh, me, I didn't react that much. I had a sore arm. I actually had the flu shot in the left arm and the COVID in the right just to see if there was a difference. And there was a difference. I had no pain at all from the flu shot, but the next day or two, my right shoulder was just a little sore. But that was it for me with this last one. So why did I choose to get the vaccine now? Uh, and I think it's good to kind of walk through the rationale because there's actually layers of rationale. So for me, uh, number one, partly it's to protect me. My risks, although my risks are really low as a 54-year-old male with, uh, who's physically fit and don't, doesn't take any medications, I have a really small risk. However, there's even less risk from the vaccine itself. So looking at risk versus benefit, it's slight protection, uh, but it's enough that I think it's worth it for me. And the other thing is that even if it doesn't prevent you from getting infected, it may shorten the duration of your infection, which might shorten the duration that I would be away from work. And because I'm busy and I got a lot of work to do, I, anything that minimizes my days of work 
work is worth it. Um, some people may know that uh, some companies have always paid for the flu shot for free, partly out of economics. They knew that when their employees got a flu shot, they missed less work, and that's why they provided it. Well, partly for the benefit of their employees, but also because there's was, was an economic incentive. Second, to protect my family. So uh, if it shortens the direction, duration of my infection, it shortens the duration I might infect somebody else. And because on a timing perspective, we have a family coming for Thanksgiving and Christmas, it might decrease the chances that I might spread it to somebody else because I would have a shorter duration of infection potentially. Also, there's an argument for protecting the community capacity. And so every winter we have a surge of respiratory viruses that does sometimes stress the capacity of our hospital system. So for vaccinating against all three of these, RSV, flu, and COVID, we can protect hospital capacity. So there's a community planning perspective as well. And part of this reason, that's why every country has done things a little different. In the United States, they're a little more aggressive saying everybody more than six months because we have less hospital excess capacity compared to other countries. So we have to protect our capacity and we have more people with chronic diseases. So uh, basically, if you look at those excess uh, deaths that are happening for decades, you'll see there's this winter surge. And this is probably from basically mostly from winter viruses, flu, RSV previously, and now COVID. And so we can minimize this peak, and but the likely stresses our hospital if we all get flu, COVID, and if indicated RSV before the winter season, we can actually protect our hospital capacity during these winter seasons. So uh, annual burden of flu, flu varies from year to year. And I sometimes point out to people that we're still doing with the flu, the, the, in, the great flu pandemic strains of 1917, 18, and 19. We're just seeing the mutated versions of those every winter since. And COVID will probably be the same way. Some years are worse than other. And typically, we have 12 to 52,000 deaths from flu and hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations and illnesses. So it's worth vaccinating against influenza. Uh, we're getting to be a better recognition about RSV. When I went through my medical training, most people thought of RSV as a children's disease. Uh, and the reason we thought of it, because that's obviously it affects kids, we didn't realize it was affecting adults because we never tested adults when I was early in my training. Now that they've started testing for all kinds of viruses, they found out that actually RSV does play a role in adult deaths as well. Uh, this estimate from the CDC is six to 10,000 deaths a year. I've seen some estimates that might be a little higher because we don't actually know because we just really haven't tested enough for it to know what the exact numbers are. But there's enough deaths that warrants us, I think, doing something not just for the kids, but the elderly. The good news is, there is a vaccine, uh, RSV vaccine for the elderly. So if you're 60 years or older, and especially with any chronic disease, you should consider getting the RSV vaccine because it will decrease your chances of hospitalization or death. Uh, in addition, we also have an RSV vaccine for pregnancy because this is primarily also affecting a lot of children. And so it, this is an interesting approach where they've actually just shown that by giving this RSV vaccine at 32 to 36 weeks in their pregnancy, the baby gets enough antibodies from mom's reaction that it actually protects the baby from being hospitalized. So you may consider it if you're pregnant uh, prior to the RSV system to get yourself vaccinated to protect your baby. And then remember all those COVID monoclonal antibodies we had? Well, we actually have an RSV one now that can be given to infants to protect them through their uh, uh, RSV season and decrease the number of children that are uh, hospitalized or, or killed from co RSV as well. And there's one to 300 deaths and uh, thousands and thousands of hospitalizations that could be prevented if we gave this monoclonal antibody to our children. The rollout has been a little slow, partly because of billing issues. It was going to be available, but we have not been able to get clear indications from employers and insurers whether they're actually going to pay for it. And it's hard to ask a pediatrician or family doc to provide this vaccine if they're not going to get, if they're going to get stiffed on the bill. And so one of the reasons for the slow rollout is, frankly, a lack of billing clarity. Still have lots of misinformation going on. I think one of the biggest ones that frustrates me and, and, and others is the memes that won't die, like Paxlovid Rebound, which actually doesn't exist. So one of my favorite uh, uh, COVID update podcasts is, is Dan Griffin on This Week in Virology. And so almost every week they kind of give yet another story of someone who was told it wasn't given Paxlovid, then he has to take care of them in the hospital, and unfortunately sometimes they die. Uh, there are terms there. Some people would just give it up and say Paxlovid Rebound. But can rebound, COVID rebound is what it really is, not Paxlovid. It can happen with or without Paxlovid because it's not due to Paxlovid. Uh, what you need to understand is there are three phases of a COVID infection. One is the acute viral phase, the first phase. This is what Paxlovid is for. And by minimizing this, you decrease the acute complication, uh, complications and later on. So it has a very large reduction, 80, 90% reduction in hospitalization or death. Then there's a second phase called the inflammatory phase. The inflammatory phase... Paxlovid does nothing for that, and that will happen with or without Paxlovid, with or without ivermectin, with or without orange juice, with or without tarot cards. 
This is just something that happens. This is what steroids are for, actually, because steroids will blunt the, your, your inflammatory response. That's what the steroids are for. It's also important to note that the steroids should not be used early on, and so the, the urgent care doctors giving the cocktail of prednisone, zinc, and zithromax were, were likely actually causing more harm than good and probably led to the deaths of some of the people who got COVID because they treated with prednisone at the wrong time. So treat the right, the right, right phase with the right drug. Uh, the mass mandate stuff, yeah, there's still a lot of misinformation out there and some of these opinion pieces. And I always point out, first, look, what is it? Is this an opinion piece? It is not a scientific article. Then also look at the author. Is this a guy who actually has any public health expertise writing this opinion? In this case, he was not. Uh, a lot of people were citing, for example, the Cochrane Collaborative claiming that it said masks didn't work, but that's not what the Collaborative article said, actually. Uh, so it was so far off that the people from the Cochrane Collaborative had actually put out a press release to say many commenters have claimed that a recently updated Cochrane view shows that masks don't work, which is an inaccurate and misleading interpretation. So this is straight from the Cochrane folk. Uh, here's another article that came out in, from the Royal Society where they really went through all the articles available. The weight of evidence from all studies suggests that wearing, wearing masks, especially, especially high-quality masks, do help, actually. But you have to put them in, on at the right time in the right settings, though, too. So you have to understand what they can and can't do. So who is an expert? This Brett Stevens. He is an opinion columnist. He is not a public health expert. Who might be a public health expert? Just Google them, see their Wikipedia page, see if they're actually somebody who does have some credibility. Now, he's a good journalist. He's won a Pulitzer Prize. But that does not mean that he has expertise in this area and that he actually knows what he's talking about. Whereas opposed to somebody like, say, Ali Khan, who's the dean of our College of Public Health and has is internationally an expert, decades of experience in CD, he is a, a public health expert and can actually speak with some authority on the topic. Um, the good news is uh, where are we going in the future of this? Well, uh, the good news is so far Omicron is uh, mutating in a little more predictable uh, or systematic way instead of random directions. And so one of the reasons we had such a big surge is that the original Wuhan strain, the, the imminent, the uh, the variants were going off in such different directions. That's why they would escape immunity. The fact that this is going in kind of a similar direction means the antibodies you might have gotten from this infection are more likely to help with this infection as opposed to this one. So by the fact, hopefully this continues, the, the, the boost that we get that's for this might help you as uh, going along. So hopefully that means our vaccine effectiveness will be better, but you can't really predict the future. It's a gamble. Uh, odds are, though, that we're heading the right direction and this booster will be helpful. General health and ventilation, I think, is another thing to con consider. I like this article about the uh, 1918 flu. There was, uh, you know, people claiming that lots of young, healthy people were dying. And so, what someone went back and did actually is found out uh, by looking at uh, skeletons of, the, the, of some of these victims in their 20s and 40s, found that actually a lot of them were actually weren't healthy. They had things like rheumatic fever, which we don't see much anymore. So, yes, there were some young, healthy people died, but most people did have some underlying conditions. And so, it argues you need to just keep yourself fit and active because uh, that's going to decrease your chances of dying because your, your overall health will affect your risk should you get infected. Uh, the other thing that I find interesting is all the hospitals were usually open with lots of windows to promote ventilation. It's a lesson I think we've forgotten. Uh, the ventilation was done, um, I think, mostly in response to tuberculosis, for example. Example. But we've been finding that actually, uh, despite some of the early theories that COVID is mostly a droplet spread disease, it is an aerosol spread disease as well. And so ventilation does make a big difference. Here are some simulations in a classroom, for example. Uh, if the teacher was standing in the front and the ventilation was back to forward versus forward to back, what difference it would make to the exposure to the kids. And so uh, the South Koreans and Japanese were some of the first to start doing some really good epidemiology. One, I remember one visual of a restaurant where you could really see the spread through the restaurant basically following the ventilation pathway from the intake and outtake of the ventilators. And so ventilation is going to be a big deal in the future. So we're seeing some uh, recommendations coming around air changes. Uh, it used to be three to four air changes and it was okay, but now they're probably pushing maybe six and above. Uh, one thing that considers Lincoln Public Schools actually has modern up-to-date ventilation systems and can do three to four. And we did our best to pump up the ventilation during the pandemic and add some filtration. Uh, this probably did have a big effect on the reason why Lincoln fared better than many other communities, partly because of our school system. Uh, about one third of a population has a direct connection to the schools. So if your schools are not spreading as much, it does make a huge uh, difference difference in protecting the population. So if you add this ventilation press masking and some of the other things we did, that probably did have a large effect and probably explains why Nebraska had a lower COVID standardized death rate than many other areas of the country. And it wasn't all of Nebraska, unfortunately. 
it was mostly Lincoln and to some extent Omaha. Non-metro Nebraska had high mortality rates uh, and pr- approaching those of, of Arizona, which went full on Great Barrington. So uh, I also think it's important that when James Lawler in the first week of the pandemic had made some projections of moderate and severe, turns out that if you did everything right, you kept, you were in this moderate range. But if you did, didn't do everything right, you hit his severe range, unfortunately. So uh, maybe the expert was kind of right. So hopefully this is helpful for you. Here's uh, some of my background so you know where I am and know that I have some expertise in these areas. Uh, Disclaimer, though, these are my opinions, not necessarily those of the organizations uh, listed here.